All right, people. So thanks a lot of being here, March 6th. So today we do have a an order, an artist, but someone as well that does, you know, tremendous work, you know, for humanity. So, you know, without further ado, we have today and the honor of having Richard Smith. All right. So Richard, just like you, <laughs> you've been knowing. So there's a lot of people now in the chat and more that's gonna come to you. All right. Okay. So just for the sake of the people, because today we're going to go left and right, because <laughs> that it's information okay. is quite vast. But only like to give like an idea to the people. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to share this. All right. So as you saw on the flyer, we're, we're going to have actually an intro, an introduction of knowing, you know, who's Richard, but we're going to tackle as well, you know, some mystical experience that he had. Uh, we'll have an overview of real estate, but, you know, in terms of, you know, where Earth or Tierra stands at, uh, galactic groups, galactic battles. Then after this, the more Indian, I'm calling it intergalactic connection. Following this, we'll go, you know, from Peter Moon, okay, to uh, Noble Jew Ali, and then after this, ancient technology. All right. So, Richard, uh, if you don't mind, so what we're going to do here, I'm just going to go on your web page and then we'll go with the uh, teaser bio. All right. That's, yeah, that's probably easier to ingest there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Richard Smith is a professional life changing speaker and motivational experiencer, web designer, and visionary author on the topic of extraterrestrial contact, the uh, Moorish legacy, human origins, and related matters. Smith received I honors at New York State University for his dedicated work with extraterrestrial intervention and alien contact phenomenon. A published author, of the groundbreaking book series, The Vaulted Journals of UFO Teacher, Smith is committed to raising conscious awareness in our health and well being as caretakers of the planet, and as well as creating a better understanding of our place in the cosmos, both physically and spiritually. He believes what we must focus, focus on the most knowledge of the lost knowledge of where we come from before we can truly understand the ancient wisdom of where we are going on the path of our everyday lives. He carries a dedicated special interest in human, uh, sorry, in special interest in making the Human Origins Foundation and the Human's Origin Conference and international success in all regions of the global community for future generations, while empowering people to realize how important they are truly are in this grandest of all adventures known as life. Globally recognized for spirating the human origins revolution, he currently resides in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, with his wife Linda Smith. Working on his next book, he has been speaking worldwide with author events, interviews, lectures, and conference. Contact him today for a book singing or speaking engagement. So just to let the people know, so Richard's website is ufoteacher.com, okay? So, and if you want to know more about Richard, then you have as well the full version, okay? So Richard, uh, right away to start, I just wanna share this, it won't be long. I'm just gonna stop the share for a moment and then I'm gonna get that picture. I love your background there. That's a great image. Nice background. And we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about it. It's, you know, the uh, crystal and technology oh. and, you know, what actually you cover in your book, all right? So. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. It won't be long because I have it on my phone actually. Uh, I wanted to show it to the people, but you know what? I'm just going to read it. Okay. Okay. 
So for everyone that would have his book or you're gonna read it. So that portion here is really a uh, page 40. So just to let you know, um, there's a phrase where Richard is stating in this respect, I would have to say that the tireless efforts of my dark skin and or female predecessors over endless millennia are finally paying off as the crowd mentality of corporatism has slowly involved in the proper direction of a deprogramming progressive global democracy. So, you know, I, I, let, I, I put like an highlight of the tireless efforts of my dark skin and female predecessor. So could you please expand on this, Richard? Because people might, might be surprised. Eh, what, he, what is he stating? And what's the connection? So allow the people to, you know, have that grasp of what you're stating here. Sure. Um, it, a lot of it, uh, a lot of the, the, the spirit of that statement that I put into the book there was to make people realize that one, I didn't always look like this because I always get that shocked look when they see a pale skin talking about this kind of stuff. And they're not too sure about where I'm coming from. And the other thing would be um, everything I know has already been with us for the last half a million years hiding in plain sight, but we didn't listen or wouldn't listen to our dark skinned predecessors, our female predecessors, the ones that came long before me and are even here among us right now. Um, and so there's a, a trigger effect. I, I even mentioned this in um, on one of the, uh, one of the human origins lectures that uh, the catch 22 is that <clears throat> we've been brainwashed not to, not to recognize the legitimacy of our dark skinned elders, but you listen to me because I'm white, but the bottom line is, you know, where do you think I learned all this from? I learned it from your dark skinned elders. So why weren't you listening to them in the first place? And why are you listening to me now? And that's where I put it right on the razor's edge. And that was that statement in the book, my dark skinned and or female predecessors. There's all these people that came before me, but nobody bothered to pay attention to them because it doesn't fit into the paradigm of a Eurocentric narrative. <clears throat> Thank you, Richard. So with that being said, um, you know, so for the people, a lot of people are, you know, blank or, you know, they have a tribe with uh, mysticism or metaphysical. Okay. So yeah. Um, can you hear me, Richard? Yeah. Yeah, I got you. Good. So yeah, a lot of people here and the one who's going to listen, they, they have that link, you know, with mysticism. Well, everyone actually, but mm -hmm. some of us are more um, uh, traveling in that field, mysticism and met met metaphysical. Uh, you know, you mentioned in your previous lectures, actually, you had two, uh, you know, metaphysical moment that you had, one at 21, mm -hmm. right? 21 mm -hmm. year old, and another, another one later on, but you know, uh, we're going to talk now about, you know, uh, some highlights that you had, you know, in terms of your metaphysical uh, experience. So right of the way, we're going to go with, you know, the sisterhood. A lot of people might know like brotherhood, but, you know, sisterhood, that's probably not the case. And just for the people. So when we talk about the brotherhood, so, you know, you can see them as, you know, guys or higher, you know, multi-dimensional uh, teachers, you know, that helps, you know, the beings, the human. So Richard, could you go with your, you know, mm -hmm. own physical experience with the sisterhood? Definitely, sure. Um, yes, it is something that most people don't pay attention to throughout history because it, uh, the foundations of it, <clears throat> 
you can find historically here on earth. Um, case in point, the foundations of Egypt is matriarchal, but you never hear about that. And when you, this is the proof of it is in the statues. A, uh, how should I say? A male chauvinistic or patriarchal viewpoint will look at a statue of a woman holding her hand on the shoulder of a man standing in front of her as if to say, oh, look, she's following the man. The truth of the matter is that's a complete false interpretation. She is the one who is the head of the household. And what she is doing is she is presenting to everyone and saying, this is my companion, this is my equal, this is who I've chosen to be my partner. And you must respect him the same way you respect me. And that's a totally different narrative to embrace. Uh, as opposed to the Eurocentric patriarchal viewpoint that there's no way a woman could be the foundations. And yet we find out that the clan mothers here in America were always the foundations of all these international treaties between Eastern and Western hemisphere. Um, in my experience, circling that back around to the sisterhood, you, you find out um, in the occult, in mysticism, that everything in life is based on female anatomy, female anatomy, whether it's the oceans of earth, <clears throat> um, the oceans of space, um, stargates, black holes, wormholes. These are all examples of going through the process of reincarnation, passing, passing through the uterus and coming out of the vagina, okay? When you're going into a stargate, you are going into the vagina, and when you come out the other side, you are essentially reborn into a new reality, another part of the universe, or another dimension for that matter. So everything about the universe is based on that female power, the, the vril power, which is what I stated in my books too, because I intentionally wanted to rescue that away from all this... Um, white supremacist garbage that came out of the Nazi party during World War II in the mid 20th century, where they fundamentally not only destroyed the meaning of the swastika, but they also destroyed the essence of the real power by using it in a weaponized manner um, to dominate the planet. And that's just not the case. Vril is associated with the ancient Egyptian word kim, al kim, the power of manifestation, which is where you get the name Kemet and Kemetian as an extension of that root word, Alkim. Uh, it is also where we get the word chemistry from. Uh, it is also where we, Alkim is how we got the word alchemy, okay, alchemist. Um, chemistry, Kemetian, all having to do with the mysteries of life, the Egyptian university system. My experience, my first awakening at the age of 21 brought me face to face with an ancient primordial entity I refer to in the book as the crone and I describe her as a female praying mantis type extraterrestrial. Uh, as it turns out, as I got to go on with that dialogue with her over the years, I came more and more into contact with what she's connected to, which is called the sisterhood, which is a collection of different human and extraterrestrial um, entities, uh, mostly female, you will find some men in there because it's not, the understanding of a matriarchy is that men and women are equal and women are just put a little bit ahead because they establish the law and the men are there to enforce the law. In a patriarchal society, it's upside down where the men control everything and women are treated like, you know, street whores, all right, second-class citizens. They don't know anything. They're just supposed to cook and clean. Um, and so in the, this matriarchal thing I refer to as the sisterhood, they, sir, they work as sort of like the midwives between the children of earth and the galactic community. They mainly focus on very gifted children um, because they don't want those gifted children falling into the hands of dark forces and being used and abused like some kind of biological weapon, okay? Like you see in movies like Firestarter by Stephen King, okay? That, that kind of a storyline um, where they were trying to weaponize these children. And so it's their 
job to protect these children. Once again, you see this historically with, in the good old days, they were referred to as Christ children, whether it was Muhammad or Jesus or Noble Drew Ali or Abraham uh, or Mithra. Uh, nowadays, we don't call them Christ children. Nowadays, we call them indigos. We call them super psychic kids. We call them hybrids, starborn. You know, we have other names for it, but it all goes back to the same Christ energy, that universal energy that Alkim and the Vril power was based on with that female principle and that feminine goddess energy. This is what made the female bloodline using, let's say, let's just use Jesus as an example, so important with Mary, her sister Elizabeth, they were the daughters of Ruth, and that bloodline goes right back to Cleopatra and right on back to Isis, okay? Um, and this is also why um, Mary Magdalene became his wife and his benefactor politically because she was well-connected politically and economically and had all the connections to protect him from, you know, uh, being assaulted or murdered. Um, and so that brings into question, well, does any Christ ever die? And the answer is no, they ascend. Uh, that's, that's the rule. The sisterhood has made that quite clear, hands off, these gifted children, you are not allowed to touch them, otherwise they, they will be held to pay. Okay. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> and uh, as another actually you know, case study, I wanna go with something that you mentioned on your, in your book, actually, um, on page 56. I'm not gonna mention uh the name in itself i'm just gonna spell it out all right and uh, it's p-h-a-r-l-e-y and it was regarding at that time when you know you went to a ufo conference yes you know I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you dealt with you know a representative of the imperial archon of the gin so uh please go ahead bro and you know expand on this yeah if, if there's Yes, that's okay. Um, my my wife cringes every time I I talk about that, so <laughs> she she hates that part of the book there because it's like it was it was kind of left final, but also open ended to some extent. Um, but no, that's um, that experience, which interestingly enough, took place when I was not just, I, I was in Roan Mountain, Tennessee at the time, and it was 2001. Um, I was there to give a lecture, but as it turned out, I was also there on a mission because I needed to find out some key information about how to help my mom combat cancer. And she wasn't doing so well. And I knew where I was going, I was gonna find the answers. Um, and, it just so happened to be, you know, nothing happens by accident that this entity that I talk about in the book there, the one whose name you spelled out, um, and he, yeah, he's actually um, a, a major figure from ancient history, and I infer it in the book too, I imply what was going on there, you know, Reincarnation plays a big role in this gambit for humanity. And this was an old grudge, an old grudge from like 10,000 years ago, okay? Um, and it had to do with um, those of us who at the time sided with the Christs and they were known as the Jed or the Jed. In plural, they referred to as Jedi. This is where George Lucas got the word Jedi from. Um, in contrast to that, he also got the word Sith from the Dark Lords of Seth, the evil son, okay? The one that works for the dark forces. Yeah. And um, so Sith and Jedi, this is where out of Earth's ancient history where he got those words from. Well, the Jed or the Jedi 
they were in line with the Vril and the Christ energy, and they were the defenders. Throughout history, that trickled down into being um, samurai versus ninja, okay, and so forth. You know, it just you know repeats itself like that. Um, and when it came time to <clears throat> defend the Temple of Solomon, um, this is when there was a uh, and call to cut down the, the Jedi and get rid of them. Um, and I, in that scenario, um, I had gone and it was warranted, but I also crossed a certain line, which I think anyone would have done at the time because they were trying to uh, find me and I found out that they went after my family at the time in that lifetime I find out that my wife and children were slaughtered because they were trying to look for me and couldn't find me so I decided to take the last group of loyalists I had with me with the Jedi and go after one of their um, head honchos there uh, one of the Countess feudal lords, and I decided to uh, basically put his head on a pike staff as a message to the rest of them that if they want me, I'm right here. And that didn't quite sit well with the sisterhood because that put you know that put a price a target on the back of my head, both I and my brother at the time. So to uh, to make sure that nothing happened, I was taken away um, by the sisterhood and put in basically asylum in Andromeda uh, and left there for quite a while until about the 1970s when the covenant was once again reenacted and uh, basically the word went out, I want him. And so they, that's when I end up coming back in this lifetime in the 70s. So, and there was that whole influx I talk about at the beginning of the second book about why the 1970s was so significant and why that erupted the way it did on the coattails of the 60s with that whole influx of new souls. Um, and then of course, you know, the battle that ensued from there with things like the Oklahoma City disaster, all those children that were killed in that bombing, that was done on purpose. You know, that that was just a spiteful and vengeful act right there towards those children. So this is uh, this is what that was all about. And in that confrontation at Roan Mountain, uh, this assassin figured out who I was and realized I was the one that got away. And here we are playing this scenario out again 10,000 years later. Only this time around, I had the mountain people on my side, which you know we know we would refer to as the Sasquatch, okay? Uh, and the significance of that is that I refer, I describe in the book that this is the one referred to as the Yesu in ancient history or the Adam, okay? Um, they were the ones in charge of watching over, almost like a big brother, okay, watching over humanity um, to see how things developed, making sure nobody was trying to pull a fast one and intercede. And so from Iesu, throughout history, you get um, Jesus or the mispronunciation, Jesus. So, and you get other variations. You get Asa, you get Isa. All these words tie in with Iesu. And if you were to go back in time and try to track down Mary and Joseph, and if you tried to pronounce the name Jesus, they wouldn't know what you're talking about because he was known as Isa. So all these things start to tie in together, but that's the mountain people stepped in at that point and helped me finally get rid of him. Um, hopefully once and for all, because I haven't seen that crop up again. 
Got you, Richard. So uh, thanks a lot of, you know, sharing you know, that, you know, one of your experience, okay, with the, with the people. So now we're gonna go to, you know, the whole thing about real estate. Okay. A lot of people know real estate only down here, but actually it's bigger, <laughs> you know, it's bigger than, you know, holding a building this and, you know, holding yes. hickories here, you know? So right before this, I just want to make a link. So I'm just going to share with okay. you only one picture. Okay. And this actually is from, uh, just want to pay homage to uh, Charles Mosley Bay, known as- Oh, yes. Bay. Yeah. Okay. Are you able like to read uh, the? Uh, no, are you able like to see the text, Richard? Oh yeah, I can see it. Sure. Sounds good. So um, I'm just gonna go with that link because we're gonna go right after this with flesh and bone. You know. Okay. With gotcha. As you mentioned, and just for the people that they know, you have you know uh, that faction, flesh and bone. And wood and stone, and wood and stone, uh, you know, out of it, Richard's mentioning, you know, hiring and oppressors. And just coming back, you know, when we look at what happened here on the American continents, you know, let's say during the 400 years, uh, we got messed up, you know. And the thing is, unfortunately, uh, that real evidence of history well, wasn't shared, okay, throughout the institution. So uh, CM Bay stated in his volume one, Clock of Destiny, volume one, volume one page 16, uh, the blonde woman of Patagonia, so that's today Argentine or Argentine, mm. right. America had manifested their culture height in the society of Islam, which qualified them to establish the Society of the Cross Latin with mystery and emotional false doctrines as a positive weapon of liberating themselves from the amalgamated iron and rulers or dictators who had shielded the secret of nature as shown in the signs of the zodiac. So I'm just gonna show it here. Okay, so one key thing that I really want to highlight is, you know, uh, the Almal Gated Iron Hand Rulers. So now we we will go back in history. So then you could go, you know. So let's say Charles V. Now you know, oh no, it's a dark skin, and you have Orzis progenitor. So you know, Felipe Uno, Felipe Dos. So you know, all the Phillips. So that's really what happened here, you know, uh, especially near Central America, you know, South America. Okay, so. Richard, without being said, you know, the Iron Hand rulers, could you go now and expand on the flesh's bone? Oh, sure, Obviously yeah. Versus, but versus, <laughs> you know, wood and stone. Right. Um, sure. And um, that's a, a great paragraph you showed there, too. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, throughout history, there is an esoteric understanding that serves to explain um, pretty much all of what's going on. Um, from the past, from the ancient past right up to the present, um, doesn't matter how long ago. And it's simply this, it's flesh and bone versus wood and stone. And flesh and bone is the understanding that you have the benevolent factions of the galactic community who are invested in flesh and bone. In other words, the uh, spiritual and ecological development of the human being from the ground up via the Temple of Solomon. That's where the Temple of Solomon and the real power and the Christ energy come into play. Um, ecological balance with the planet, Mother Earth, Gaia, um, and, um, and a spiritual balance with your technology as you grow and evolve, okay? So there's more of an investment in the human being, the human condition. On the flip side of that, you have the other issue, uh, wood and stone. And that signifies the uh, entities, elements, or factions of the galactic community who have a vested interest in the property or the real estate that the human being lives on. 
And in this case, we're talking about whole planets. We're not just talking about, about section block and lot number here. Whole planets are seen as chunks of real estate, okay? Um, we have nine planets, that's nine chunks of real estate. They're all extremely valuable. And so Wooden Stone is more of the malevolent corporate factions in the galactic community who see the human being as nothing more than, you know, cheap indigenous slave labor, um, replaceable, not very valuable, good for pushing buttons and pulling strings and digging out stuff from caves and mines. Um, and following, uh, you know, goose stepping our way to a, an economic slavehood. Okay. Um, they don't put any value in life. Their value is in the tradable commodities that those slaves live on the land down below. And in fact, what's quite interesting is that even though we have, you know, 50 states, New York, there's a reason why New York is referred to as the empire state, because they are the ones that dictate pretty much what the other 49 states are going to follow in terms of real estate law. They don't have to, but they do. And so everybody always looks to New York state to see, you know, what, you know what's the updates on real estate law. If you look at a real estate salesperson's guide, the official legal definition of real estate is any uh, plat and any section of land down to the center of earth and up into outer space. Now, if there's no such thing as extraterrestrial contact, why would you need that kind of a very alien, foreign, esoteric definition for real estate? Okay. There's no reason for that definition to legally and officially exist on the books if it wasn't already influenced by half a million years of galactic community influence, okay, and social conditioning on behalf of the whole wooden stone investment. So these, this is the friction here. You got the benevolent factions with flesh and bone and the malevolent factions with wooden stone. Um, so, and this is what it comes down to. And that is where a lot of that friction comes from and why you constantly get all of these contradictory reports coming in from people who have had these experiences, because um, let's face it, what, you know, why are some having awesome educational experiences uh, with extraterrestrial entities or metaphysical beings or interdimensional experiences of some sort, and yet others are having malevolent, horrific experiences? Um, and you know, why are we using the excuse? All oh, these, you know. You misinterpreted it, really? Well, if a person misinterpreted a bad experience, aren't they also supposed to be able to misinterpret a good experience? Why do we accept the good experience, but we discount the bad one? Okay, so this is, the, this is where things have gone on. And why is that? Well, when you strip away all of the ridiculous booga booga, hocus pocus, conspiratorial garbage that you know, everybody loves to throw out there because, you know, there's nothing better than the politics of fear to get someone to buy your books or watch your movie or listen to your rhetoric or propaganda or follow you in some kind of ridiculous, you know, cult following. Once you strip all that garbage away, what it comes down to is economics. That's all it is. Okay, on one side, you got the spiritual development of the human being. On, on, the, on the flip side, you got the economics. Okay. And it's always been said by any economist, any political advisor, that first comes economics, and the escalation of economics is politics, and the escalation of politics is war. And war is the profiteering of economics. So it all feeds on itself like a vicious cycle, okay? There's no such thing as a genuine war of good versus evil. It's always an issue of who's making a profit and who's using that war to camouflage the supply lines for prostitution, guns, and drugs, okay? Um, the, the best example to point out, it, I mean, you could pick any example, but in our own history, the so-called uh, civil war, okay? Um, that was manufactured, okay? Because you had the same Masonic members 
from the Masonic lodges in the north communicating with the Masonic lodges in the south. And when the cost factor, when the liability of the cost factor outweighed the financial assets of gaining a profit, then the whole thing falls flat. The same thing happened with the war for independence. Okay, it was profit driven. Um, once you start teeter tottering and falling into the red and out of the black, a war will fall flat rather quick. Uh, and you saw the same thing happen with the war in Iraq, the invasion of Afghanistan, World War I, World War II. Once the liability outweighs the asset, everything falls flat. What you find out here is that the interest that's being taken in us is a real estate interest. And by feudal law, there's always going to be one planet in a solar system that is considered the throne of power. And by feudal law, if you own that throne, if you control that throne, you own all the other chunks of real estate too, all the other planets. In this case here, the battle is over Mother Earth. And whoever can keep the slave asleep long enough, you know, the 80-20 scenario that I talk about in the books, whoever can keep 80% of the population asleep long enough to circumvent and cut the legs out from the Moorish legacy or the covenant of Earth, uh, will own the planet, keep us in indentured servitude, and therefore own the entire solar system, or the solar kingdom, as I call it, and therefore all the other tradable commodities from all the other planets. So once you start framing it from the narrative of economics, then it makes sense. Why are they always coming to Earth? Well, this is the reason why. You have the throne of power right here. There was a time where it may have been Mars, but once things collided in the, these cataclysmic collisions, and planets started moving around and we fell into an artificial third orbit, we became the throne, okay? So this is what all that's about. And once you explain it from the perspective of real estate as being the backbone of the alien abduction phenomena, all the other crazy narratives and false narratives just slip away. <clears throat> it's about profit, okay? There's a reason why we have a stock market. We didn't come up with that idea. That was handed to us on a silver platter, all right? And there's nothing new about the stock market. As it is above, so it is below, all right? Just like with the light bulb or a smoke glass building or a skyscraper or an iPad or a smartphone, there's nothing new under the sun. All these technological advancements existed 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. We just keep cycling through the same level of stupidity every time. Well, explain that, Richard. And you know what? You, you mentioned several things. Uh, we could definitely easily. <laughs> this, but, uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> we restricted. But you know what? Now was going to make what you've been saying. We're going to make now a beautiful link. Because you know you mentioned about you know the real estate as it is, and you know factions. Uh, the next thing, uh, let's talk about it, but as a teaser, because we're okay. going to later on. You know, so okay. now it's with all that being said, real estate it's the birthright. So just to let you know, we had uh, Mari Morena actually two days ago, and she you know. She shared to the people, you know, birthrights, but you know, on a cosmic uh, aspect of it. So now you mentioned this. So the royal estate, and you know, the link with the uh, genetic codes, and the link with you know the ankles, and let's because you knew him, not me personally, but probably on the astral, uh, Doctor Devil Blair, you know. Oh, uh, yes. Mentioned about how certain words, you know, had a K, but it changed it, you know, with a G. So it's like, you know, Negro, necromancy, and they change it, you know, uh, Negro. He had it actually, you know, uh, that information through for, just for the people that they know, you know, through a mystical experience. So please give a give a teaser, Richard, from birthrights, royal states, you know, the genetic code and the ankyls. Sure. Um, just as a teaser, um, 
I'll just say angels are not what you think and they do exist and they actually are directly connected to our Christ energy and the bloodline that uh, gave birth to the Moorish legacy here on earth. Sounds good. So, you know, that, that, that alone will keep, you know, <laughs> I'll keep it that way. Okay. <laughs> We're going to come back. We're going to come back. So now let's go to the uh, galactic groups and galactic battles. Uh, probably I don't share this much of the time, but you know, when I reach to you, I give you like an overview, you know, and you know, it's the fact of my, um, I remembered interventions that I did, you know, on Lyra in Orient. So uh, you did actually a couple of years back ago, you did actually a um, lecture at Temple University. Yes. Right? We had some photos. It's not probably clear, but you know, I'm just gonna share, I'm just gonna share the link here. Not the link, okay. just the picture. I'm just gonna check, yeah share the picture all right so the title is uh european confession of a moorish legacy so anyone who might not know it wants to go and you know have a look through it so hey richard uh with that being said i just want to make a link with you know orion and lira and uh, even you know in vigo I, I don't want to go like into the de details because i want to make the uh, the emphasis on you and you know what you have to share could you go again and give us, you know, an overview structure of the uh, galactic uh, groups with, hmm. you know, with what you sure. discover, you know, you know, um, what you what you find interesting and that is there's two things that serve as a uh, solid foundation to understand what's going on. One is economics, like we talked about briefly before. And the other is etymology or linguistics, okay? I have always said over the years, if you don't know where your words are coming from, then you don't really know what you're saying and you can be easily controlled. So, and we're not talking about, it doesn't necessarily have to be a $50 word like Merovingian. It could be something as simple as cat, dog, angel, devil, God, okay? You know, everyday stuff that we take for granted that we have been socially conditioned to see in one way or another, or even react to in one way or another, instead of responding properly with the proper question of where did that word come from? Um, so even like on that board there, um, and yes, I did have a lot more hair back then. But uh, even on that board there, um, this was, I think, uh, 2007 when I did this. Yeah, 2007. And um, you, have, um, you have to ask yourself, why have we always been subject to what seems to be a two-party system? Where did that idea come from? Where did that come from? Where did our words come from? Where did our economics come from? But when you look out at the ancient galactic community and what has filtered down to us, you find out that um, there's always, no matter where you go, where you look, you have that two-party system of upper management and middle management, okay? And yes, you'll notice I, I don't use uh, ridiculous made up terms like other people might use. I use concrete terms that people can sink their teeth into and relate to, okay? So upper management, middle management, okay? Um, Two-party system. There's always one that's going to decree the laws and the other one that's there to carry it out, middle management. Um, in this case here, uh, you have to wonder, um, where did the term Aryan come from, as in Aryan super race, white supremacy? Well, you find out that comes from the, what I refer to in the book as the Empire of Orion, or better yet, Arian Empire. Arian, A-R-I-A-N. 
from Arian, you get two other mispronunciations, Arian with a Y or Orion, as in Orion constellation, which is exactly the location of the empire I'm talking about here. And the ones running the show there are, used to be the kings, but the queens took over because they had a lot more ambition. And I go into detail about what that truly means in the book there too. Um, when the queens took over, what do they look like? Okay, why has there always been this inherent, uh, belligerent favoritism towards that pale skinned association? Well, as it turns out, the Arians are the ones who are running the show, the kingpins, the royals, are your uh, pale skin reptilian queens, okay? Yes, they have their warrior class, the Dracos, which have a darker look to them, dark green, dark brown, but the ones at the top of the heap are pale skin reptilians, okay? And just imagine a bipedal Komodo dragon, hold on there. Sorry about that, that was the dog. But just imagine a bipedal Komodo dragon standing on two legs and you'll have a pretty good idea as to how imposing and intimidating that would be face to face. Um, they were called the Arians. That's where we get Arian super race from. Um, and this is also where we get the reference to Orion. They were also part of a special class called the Sita Queens, that was their name. Down through history, Sita, uh, spelled triple S dash T-A, S-S-S dash T-A, ends up being mispronounced as Satan or Satan, okay? Now, that doesn't discount where the other derivation came from, from Shaitan, because that is equally um, an etymological history from Shaitan. You get Satan, Shaitanist, Satanist, Satan. It's the one word in history where it comes from two completely different sources, but ends up meeting up in the middle as meaning the same thing. Okay. Um, and so they were known as the Sita Queens. So um, these misguided individuals who call themselves Satanists really don't know what they're talking about because they don't understand where that word came from in terms of cosmology. Are we talking about some evil? Sure, but we're talking about economic slavery as evil. We're not talking about anything supernatural or intangible, okay? They're flesh and bone. They can bleed just like you and me, all right? Um, in association with that two-party system, these queens represented upper management. So who was middle management? Well, that was the other empire I talk about in the book called the Canis Feudal Lords, which ties right in with the earlier experience with the character we talked about before. And the Canis Feudal Lords, Canis, K-A-N-U-S, okay? Yes, that is exactly what it sounds like. From Canis, you get the K, and you'll see throughout history, there is always a, missing, a misspelled relationship between K and C. Christ is K-R-S-T, but along the way, it was spelled C-H. Canis is spelled K-A-N-U-S, but along the way it became Canis, C-A-N-I-S. And from Canis, you get canine, dog, okay? What's more interesting, and even more interesting, is that that's exactly who they were. They were pale-skinned, bipedal canines. Well, <laughs> you have a, a reptilian that can change shapes by using mind over matter, through psyops and you have a walking canine, is it any wonder where we got that other two party system from known as vampires and werewolves? This is where it comes from. This is where that mythology comes from. And if you look at the, mov the, uh, the movies, the underworld movies you see, they replicate that. The vampires are upper management and the werewolves are middle management, okay? Um, and so that's all part of the two party system. The canines or the Canis feudal lords, they had their own warrior class called the Dukes, DK, the Dukes of War. Well, over time, Duk became mispronounced as dog. And that's where we get the phrase dogs of war from. Uh, yes, that's, that's the movies there. And if you watch that whole um, saga in the Underworld series, they're 
basically mimicking the Satak queens and the Canis feudal lords. Now that's what that story symbolizes, the two-party system of upper management and middle management. So you have the Dukes of War, the Canis feudal lords, uh, you have the Draco warrior class, and from Draco, you get the mispronunciation Dracul for vampire, and therefore dragon, okay, because they're bipedal Komodo dragons, they're bipedal reptiles, this is where we get the concept of a dragon or a serpent from. Um, and this, these two empires did not get along at all, because they were both after expanding their empires, expanding their real estate territory, expanding their real estate holdings and profits. So they collide with each other and they go at it with each other and they realize once again, what's the lesson to learn here? Economics. They realized that going to war with each other was not financially feasible. They were taking losses. They were having liabilities. They were losing assets. So they were forced economically to come to some kind of amicable agreement, a tentative agreement to work together. The Queens became upper class, the Canis Fuel Lords became middle class. And so as, as the, these two empires start to expand, they eventually find our little backwater system here on the outer fringes of the galaxy. And oh that's where all that takes place. Um, I'll stop there if you want me to. Hi, how are you? Hi, hey, 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 what's man? going on, man? Yeah, yeah, how's it going? Good, good. <laughs> good yeah. to meet you there. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Richard. So, uh, with that being said, um, we're going to tackle some example and you know, out of your okay. book. Now we're going to come. So, with that thing, uh, you gave the teaser. So, now let's. Oh. And more on this. Okay, sure. Yeah, genetic code and why? Why you know it's like with the royal estate. Okay. The, as yeah. you mentioned it in your book, the sun kiss people. Right. They, they yes. People of God, so. Okay, so we're gonna go where angels dare not tread. So if there's anyone that has a little trouble understanding in reality, where words like angel and god and devil came from now's your chance to back out okay <laughs> so because once you hear this you can't go back and it's going to change your whole paradigm sorry. sorry can i ask a question sure go ahead um the uh the anunnaki which is the rept reptilian race are they good or are they evil um there's um, a lot of different races involved with the Anunnaki and the ones I talk about serve as their own form of middle management. And I didn't paint a good picture of them in the book. Okay, so no, I don't see them ultimately as the good guys. And if you want to more expand it, you've probably seen this already, but I'll just put it out there anyway. If you want a more expanded understanding of them in in the historical context um i recommend you watch a very good seven part documentary series by damon t berry called knowledge of the forever time it's on youtube you can catch it for free but make sure you watch them in sequence don't jump ahead you know you got to watch them in sequence otherwise it won't say, make that, any sense. say that again please uh the, the knowledge of the forever time and it's by damon T. Berry. Uh, check that out. You're going to really enjoy that as to what he gets into. Yeah. And uh, Richard, allow me to mention something. So uh, we do going to talk about, you know, Anunnaki. So just in order like to, you know, let the spirit or richer spirit, you know, flow, we'll reserve any questions at the end. Okay. So Richard could go, you know, from topics to topics more fluidly. Okay, so people just, you know, raise your, your reserve your question to the end. All right, so uh, Richard, please go. Okay, ahead. so uh, here's where we uh, start bringing the whole concept of etymology and economics together under one roof, okay? And then you'll see how these two sleep in the same bed together. Um, at a time, 
Um, and, and, and mind you, there's more details about this in the book. We're just going after certain key pockets here just to bring up the, the bullet points. But after that expansion and the power struggle into our, into our solar system, that expansion to our solar system, Earth is now taken over as a profit-driven motive, okay, um, with all sorts of valuable resources to be garnered from the whole entire solar system. Um, there were certain power struggles that took place. One of the main power struggles was between uh, two very infamous brothers, um, a very sadistic individual known as Prince Enlil, and his scientist brother, Prince Aya, and their sister, Princess Ninhursag. There were three of them. But Prince Aya and Ninhursag worked together on one side of the equation, and Prince Enlil was on the other side. Enlo was the eldest brother. So by feudal law, he was put in charge by the father, King Anu. And the brother, did, Enlo did not want that. He couldn't stand being here, couldn't stand the sight of our primate ancestors, couldn't stand any of it. But he was the eldest brother and his father laid down the law and said, look, I need you to get this operation under control. Otherwise, it's going to be both your and my head on a silver platter because the reptilian queens are not going to put up with this. And yes, King Anu took his marching orders from the reptilian queens, the Sata queens. Um, but he was the kingfish here. So the elder brother, Enlo, he's running the operation. He was constantly at odds with his brother who and sister, Ia and Ninhursak. They are known as the master geneticists which is where you get the concept of a creator God from, okay? Creating life out of the raw genetic material that already exists in the given environment. Well, of course, what's the raw genetic material? Our cousins, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, okay? The raw genetic material that is already indigenous to the planet. Um, the experiments were moving along, many of them, failed miserably and horrendously uh, and eventually one is successful <clears throat> and in that one experiment that's successful um, you have a primate that is able to stand upright um, and the problem is how did you get how do you get it to take simple basic orders, push buttons, pull strings, dig the, dig out the core, you know, dig out the ore, the coal, the gold, the silver, all that for the profit-driven motives there that served the engine of the empire. Um, and this was a conundrum they were in. Well, um, Ninhursag, once again, the female presence here is the one that saved the day. She worked in tandem with her brother, Aya. They were a tag team. This is where you get the male, female, yin, yang, understanding throughout history that yin yang syzygy jesus mary magdalene all that relationship comes from that original relationship between prince aya and princess ninhursag brother and sister working together as creator gods um princess a prince aya was having a problem figuring out how to give the beast the ability to take orders and commands but be dumb enough because of cardinal rule to not know any sense of self-awareness, no sense of self-awareness, just a pure robot, pure slave. Um, and so they had a relationship with another extraterrestrial race, or in this case, a race I refer to in the book as ultra-terrestrials known as the Ankhils. And that name is spelled out on the board there in the screenshot, A-N-K-H-E-L-E-S, Ankhils, okay, plural. They are described as an avionic bird-like race. Their best representation ever on screen was in the movie, The Abyss by James Cameron. Those extraterrestrial beings that lived under the ocean, that's your Ankiel right there. Um, you could see through them. They weren't there, but they were there at the same time because you could still touch them, okay? They, that, that transparent concept of walking between dimensions all right, um, they are one of the superior races that are put in charge of 
the genetic code for passion. Why? Well, if you're going to be a creator guide, you know, you can't have every race in the galactic community going out and seeding life everywhere. It would be pure mayhem. You have to have certain races that are in charge of keeping it under lock and key so that if you want to give sentience to a creation, you have to go through them and get permission. Prince Aya and Princess Ninhursag had a close-knit relationship with the Ankhils and went to them. They had the genetic code for passion. They got it from them. They take the genetic code for, uh, for passion and plug it into what's referred to as the Adapa, the upright beast. And why is that significant? Well, the word ad, apa, ad, at, mud, clay, okay? Apa, A-P-A, -A, ape. This is where we get the word ape from, okay? Ape doesn't, even though we've associated it with gorillas and orangutans and chimpanzees, the point is it also refers to humans too. Ape just means to mimic, to follow orders, to obey commands, okay? and you are a beast of the clay and mud of the earth. That's what adapa means, adapa. Um, in contrast to that, you have the other word, ad om, Adam, okay? Um, so here they take that genetic code for passion, I think, therefore I am, and plug it into the beast. And all of a sudden, um, they have the perfect creation now. Uh, what came out of that was the ability to teach some of them forbidden knowledge, which went totally against the grain, uh, against the decree from Prince Enlo not to teach the beast anything about his true origins. Okay, this special class of Adapa were then taken into, and this is where you get the concept of a church, a temple, a mosque, uh, a coven, okay, you church, temple, or mosque, secret meetings, secret societies, these special creatures who now had this elevated sense of self awareness were now brought into caves. And those caves were lined with a, a crystal. And essentially, at the flick of a switch, the crystal that lined the cave walls would light up and serve as a frequency or a conduit to plug information through mass communication right into their brains. It was mass teaching. And this became a very useful tool because when you're trying to do something illegal like this on the fly without being uh, caught, you gotta have some form of technology that can work it along. The gene for passion accelerated that learning process in a big way. And yes, I, I am abbreviating a lot from the book here. I go into more detail about it in the book, but um, that, uh, that gene for passion in, in, con in conjunction with the crystal technology accelerated the learning process. And so this special group of slaves, which were now separate from the others because of their genetic enhancements, were now learning forbidden information about their own origins, which was absolutely forbidden by cardinal rule. Um, and that special group of Adapa were no longer known as Adapa. Now they were known as uh, Adam, A-D-O-M or A-D-A-M, okay? Atum in Egyptian history, A-T-U-M, it's all the same word, okay? Same thing, Atum, A-T-O-M, okay? That's where science got the word Adam from, okay? Um, Atum, Adam. The frequency, Om. Second half of that word, um, om, om, that means frequency. The frequency that awakens the beast of mud and clay. That's what the word Adam means, okay? And from that, they became known as the anointed ones. And the anointed ones were called the Iesu. And I talked about before what Iesu led to as far as pronunciation or mispronunciation. Um, to this day, uh, we don't call them the Iesu anymore. We don't call them the Adam. Nowadays, we call them Sasquatch, Yeti, Yawi, Orang Hutan, Water Bobjin, okay? Uh, we have all these different, we call them the Berserker. We call them the Green Men. Uh, we have all these, every culture uh, has some form of a Sasquatch in their history. And this is the reason why, because they are the guardians watching over us. The word Ankil, 
the ones that gave us that genetic code for passion, the ability to think, therefore I am, okay? Um, if you look at the word ankiel, uh, eventually over time, it became mispronounced as angiel, as in Los Angeles. And then from there, angel, a truncated mispronunciation. So the word angel refers to the ankiels, the extraterrestrial or ultra terrestrial race that gave us the ability to wake up, okay? Uh, in the root word of ankiel, you have the word ankh. Why is that significant? Well, that's where the word ankh came from, A-N-K-H, which became misspelled as O-N-K, the other spelling. Why is that significant? Well, when you look at the ankh, what is it the shape of? It's always misinterpreted as an angel. That's half an understanding and mostly a misinterpretation, okay? In truth, I mentioned before, they are an avionic bird-like race. Well, what is the ankh? It has the head of the bird, the wings of a bird, and the tail of a bird. It was a technological universal communicator that Prince Aya used to talk to the beast, talk to the Adapa, the Adam, the anointed ones. He actually spoke through it, and it spoke to them, into their minds. So since he used, since Prince Aya used the Ankh, and had such a close relationship with the Ankhils, he became known as the Ankh or the Ankhi. And Ankhi became mispronounced as Enki. And this is how his other name comes about, Enki. Okay, which is a mispronunciation once again of the word Ankhils. So all these words start to gel together in, within the same pool of etymology and linguistics. All right, once you understand how they all fit together, that genetic code for passion, bringing it right up to speed with the Moorish legacy, that genetic code for passion ended up in a, in a esoteric and occult way of understanding it, ends up passing through the Temple of Solomon. And when it comes out the other side, it becomes known as the passion of the Christ. That's where that concept comes from. The Passion of the Christ is a reference to the genetic code that was passed on to us by the Ankiels, AKA the angels, okay? Um, and because of that, you now have the foundations of the Temple of Solomon being built on earth. And we are not talking about anything physical because the bad guys who are invested in wooden stone would see the Temple of Solomon as a chunk of real estate to own, manipulate, control, and destroy. And it was never that at all, why? because the ancient concept of the word temple is the body, body, mind, and spirit, the temple of Sal Oman. It's in the name, Solomon. Sal is sun, Om is frequency, as we mentioned before, on is spirit, the spirit and frequency of life that awakens the body, awakens the beast. Temple is a reference to the human body. So the temple of Solomon is the awakening of the beast via the Christ energy and the real power the gene for passion becomes the passion of the Christ. And from that is the rudimentary foundational beginning of the Moorish legacy as a revolution and a rebellion against the corporate titans of Orion, AKA the Sata Queens. <clears throat> Thank you, Richard. And just like Richard mentioned, that's a, you know, short overview because Richard, I'm pretty sure you could, you know, extend on this. <laughs> you know, so, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, I'm going to share something else as well from your book. It's on page 152. So in terms of, you know, uh, etymology and almost using the, the fact, you know, sounds, sounds when we tap into it, depending on the levels, you know, it does wonders, but at the same time too, it brings damage. So allow me to share this, Richard. So it's out of your book, page 153. I'm gonna show it here. All right. And you know what? I'm just gonna make a, a quick link. I'm just gonna okay. make Okay. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna show this actually, okay? Because, um, uh the information that was shared that 
You know, it's something that happened actually in December of 2020. So, you know, and uh, it it is the ob observatory, you know, so-called Puerto Rico. Oh, so yes. I'm just going to let it go here. All right. So, oh, boy. bam, bam. So oh. the info that I was informed, not you know, not by someone that I know. So it's called Peter the Insider. He uh, just mentioned that this actually was done by the infamous Grays. So in your book, uh, Richard, you mentioned, uh, you know, some infos regarding this. And again, again, peace and salute to Dr. Devil Blair. Because it's through him actually back then that I, you know, really got introduced to this. So you mentioned here, uh, Richard, every time, because, you know, we have a lot of people, you know, that might say it. And, you know, there's unfortunately still in the uh, programming. So every time you say the word amen, you are summoning and worshiping the grace. And at the bottom two, you explain, you know, the concept of amen. So I'll let you, Richard, again, expand on this. Sure. Um, yeah, this is one of those things, once again, where you could hear a pin drop in the middle of a seminar auditorium when I bring this up. Um, the, okay. Your original high priesthood, uh, your original, uh, how should I say, um, teachers, um, going back to the old, old kingdom of Egypt and whatnot, the original genuine high priesthood uh, was part of, was definitely dedicated to the Temple of Solomon. It's in their name. They were referred to as the Am'an. Slightly different spelling. It makes a difference. Even though I'm usually saying vowels don't count, here's one of those rare instances where it does because their name was A-M-M-O-N, Am'an, okay? And that's the second, that's the, uh, the last two syllables of Sal Oman, okay? Aman, Omen, Oman, okay? Um, they were, their allegiance was to the Christ energy, the real power, the power of Al-Kim, okay? The Kamishan Mysteries, the Egyptian Mystery School, um, the ancient uh, legacy uh, that was passed down from the Ankils to us, the Nogenic Code for Passion. So the Greys didn't like that. They saw that particular high priesthood and that non-physical entity known as the Temple of Solomon as a threat to them because they can't categorize a spiritual entity inside of a real estate commodity. It can't be commodified into something tradable and controllable. So they decide to attack it and they infiltrate the high priesthood by the time you get to the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, it's already been decimated and it becomes known as the Amen Ra, totally different entity. They stole the name Amon, changed it to Amen, A M E N dash Ra. Why? Well, this was the grace. So they attached the name Ra to the end of the word Amen because Ra everyone was brainwashed into thinking that was the sun god and that couldn't have been farther from the truth. The original sun god was Adam, but they didn't want anyone, since they had an ax to grind against the Sasquatch, AKA the Adam, the Yesu, the anointed ones, they didn't want anything associated with that. So they, tr they changed it, they sabotaged it. They just decided to slap the word Ra on the end and say, this is the sun god, and we are in control of it. And by associating their name, Amen, with the word Ra, they put themselves in the position of looking all powerful in terms of controlling uh, the very thing that fuels that organic real estate, that planet, which is of course the sun, okay? If you can associate yourself with the power of the sun, the power of light, then you can look all powerful. Um, amen, over time, this high priesthood known as now the Amen Ra, the corrupt priesthood, the illegitimate one, uh, realizes that um, they can't really go through time being called the Amen Ra 
because that's going to be a dead giveaway. Someone's going to pick up on that. So they decide to create a shell corporation. And that shell corporation is what we refer to today as Vatican City, um, the Vatican itself, St. Peter's Basilica and all that. And the person that they sabotaged or sucker punched into being their lackey to do this was that uh, person we refer to as St. Peter and St. Paul, mainly St. Peter, which is why he ends up crucifying himself upside down once he realizes the way he was being used as a patsy for the Greys to build their shell corporation, Vatican City. Why did he crucify himself upside down? Because it was his way of showing what a fool he was, what an idiot he was to be sucker punched like this and how the entire world had been turned upside down. Um, and the significance of that is when you are hung upside down, you die because all the blood floods into your brain and you suffocate the crown chakra and the third eye. So, um, and he realized that his own small-minded bitterness towards Jesus for aligning, for, because Jesus aligned his church and his following with a female principal, Mary Magdalene, he had a bitter ax to grind because he couldn't stand Mary Magdalene, hated her. In fact, if you look in the literature from the Daughters of Isis and female maidens, masons, they admit in there that there, at least half the apostles couldn't stand women. They had this misogynistic attitude towards women, so they hated Mary Magdalene to the core. Um, and so that's where all that, that the Greys homed in on that and used that to manipulate Peter to build the Vatican for them. But once the Vatican was built, they didn't need him anymore. And that's when they exposed themselves to him and said, we're done with you. This is who we are, get lost. And that's when he killed himself. So because they are the Amin Ra, this is how, and they built Vatican City as their shell corporation. This is how we get sucker punched with saying amen at the end of the Our Father and the Hail Mary. It definitely gives credence to the idea of why Christians have a big problem with demonic possession, because if you keep worshiping the word amen, you are inviting that animosity into your soul. Thank you, Richard. That's uh, well said. Um, I'm gonna go now. You know, we're gonna tackle uh, that subject quickly. So it's regarding mind control. Okay, so more, a lot of people might know MK Ultra. Okay, and uh, which is uh, which again that info was transferred and be used mostly in the army. You got some other types of uh, mind control. I'm just gonna show you here. Um, you know, with this power military corporation known as Monarch. Okay, so they use it, you know, constantly in the uh, entertainment business and the politics at the same time too. So Richard, one thing too, you know, that is being done here, but you mentioned the uh, Chateau Queens and you mentioned in the new book as well, you know, their capacity what they're doing with mind control. Yeah, they are, um, they be, the uh, Shata Queens became masters of PSYOPs. They elevated it to an art form and it's how they remained as upper management because they were able to use it to make deals in their favors with the Canis feudal lords and keep them as middle management and obedient. Um, to this day, that has, when you look, um, the queens belong to, that elite core of PSYOPs was, and mind control was known as the CIA CAR, C-I-A-K-A-R. Once you know that, it's no mystery as to why the OSS was replaced by the CIA at the end of World War II. It was their way of saying, well, this is our allegiance to this kind of mind control. Okay, I mean, what was the point of changing it from the OSS to CIA and then coming up with an excuse 
and backpedaling on the initials and saying, well, it stands for Central Intelligence Agency. Well, how is that any different from PSYOPs? You're just using different words, okay? Um, and every time people try to defend the CIA as being real Americans, it disgusts me because they are designed to go into other countries and create puppet dictators and topple anything that doesn't agree with the overall global agenda for a profit-driven motive for the Sata Queens and the Canis feudal laws, the two-party system. Um, so you have now, as middle management goes on this planet, you have the good old boys network, you have the billionaire boys club, okay? Um, Another form, another extension of that mind control is what I refer to in the book as um, the outcropping of the Amin Ra um, is the Chateau regime. Chateau, S-H-E-T-U, Chateau regime. From Chateau, since they are the reigning government, from Chateau you get the word shadow. And this is how we get this concept of saying the phrase shadow government without, without actually knowing where the word shadow came from or what it really means, okay? Um, there's, a, there's an origin for the word shadow. It doesn't just mean something that's operating in the shadows. It means a title to a reigning government that was put in place a very, very long time ago, like the Gestapo of Nazi Germany, okay? Or the Schutzstaffel, no different, which is where they got the idea from too. So the mind control is an effort on behalf of these entities to once again, what's the overall goal? Keep the Moorish legacy buried, keep the crass energy buried, keep the real power buried, destroy the female principle in any way imaginary and ultimately target the gene for passion, okay? target that because if you can destroy that you can destroy uh, the ability to establish a bloodline of feudal law that says the human race owns this planet and nobody else does and if we claim, if we can lay claim to that then we can lay claim to the whole entire solar system which the which means by law these malevolent forces have to pack their bags and leave because the slave woke up and so this is the overall agenda. Now, how do you use those mind control practices to keep the slave asleep? Well, you target the mind to destroy the body and you target the body to destroy the mind. It's a symbiotic relationship um, in, the, in the good sense of homeopathy and immunotherapy, yes, but also it can be used by the bad guys too. Because if you can psychologically induce all sorts of emotional trauma to the state of where you are brainwashed day in, day out of feeling helpless, then what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna let your health go. Psychologically, you're gonna induce disease upon your metabolism. And once disease sets into the temple of Solomon, okay, now you can start targeting that gene for passion um, and therefore contaminate the mind. Because once the body becomes corrupt, then it goes back to corrupting the mind, vice versa. So this animosity, this overt, obviously overt, belligerent hatred and venomous nature towards the human condition, um, you really have to take a few steps back and ask yourself, why the hell are they doing this? And this is the reason why, because they are so damn afraid of that 80-20 scenario working against them where the other 80% actually wakes up and realizes, oh, this is what's going on and you can't control me anymore because I know who you are. Then they lose control. They lose their profit margin. They, they lose their, their, uh, their uh, source of powering the empire by strip mining the solar system left and right. So this is where all these things start to tie together. Um, you know, I, I hear other people talk about this stuff like, you know, once again, the crazy stuff like, you know, uh, some blood sacrifice and all of that. And I'm like, those are symptoms. You're not looking at the cause. Look at the economics. Look at the real estate. 
look at the health condition of the human being. Why is the human being sick all the time? Okay. I mean, once, if you're willing to tackle that, all this other minutia washes away. Okay. But if you're just looking at the minutia of all this dark, disgusting, conspiratorial stuff, you're not going to get anywhere because now you're being led around by the nose by someone who's spewing a bunch of hateful rhetoric just to get you to pay attention to them. My attitude is, hey, I've told you what you need to know. Go your own way. Take it your own way and make it your own. You don't need me anymore. So, you know, but um, that's... uh, that's the crux of the mind control right there. And as far as the initials MK, everybody's like, well, we're not really sure what it meant. Actually, we do know. I mentioned it before. K, C, they have that historical relationship. MK means mind control with a K instead of a C. Mind control ultra. So. <clears throat> Thank you, Richard. Uh, that's really uh, well explained. All right, so time is advancing, Richard. You know what? <laughs> you mentioned Andromeda. <laughs> you uh, that thing really, uh, you know, flash, flash through my DNA. You know, so that's gonna be for our, for another session. Okay. Okay. Uh, your star uh, galaxies. Uh, let's go with now with you know with three questions, Richard. Uh, sure. You no, know, with that's not the Q and A's. That's only like you know the. Uh, the session between the Q and A. So I just want to, uh, you know, I'd let the people have a chance, but I just want to go with this. So I'll give you three questions and, you know, that's going to be expressed. All right. And uh, let's say within half a minute, uh, please, you know, share what it is. So first of all, uh, Peter Moon, you know, so Peter mm-hmm. been doing a lot of works on time travel and Allow me again, because uh, to share this. So I'm just going to read that phrase here. So Peter had this look on his face that gave me that gave the impression of one who has been waiting in keen anticipation for me to come to this point in my life. And knowing that, uh, you know, Peter is doing, you know, some works and things, extensively works on time traveling. Okay, and synchronicity. Could you expand on this and what Peter really brought to you or your work or your influences? Oh, sure. Um, I had, I, I've, I've known Peter Moon for many years. Um, ever since uh, he first came on the scene with the first Montauk Project book many years ago, um, in the, what was it, the 1996, 97, when I, uh, oh no. 94, I got to correct myself, when I first uh, met him at one of his meetings there talking about it, and it ignited a lot of things inside of me. Um, And over the years, I had stayed in contact with him and um, kept on track with his books, um, including the new series of books centering around Romania now with the secret projects going on over there. Mm -hmm. But it was in 2005 where he comes to me, he says, you know, um, there's something I've crossed paths with that I know is meant for you. He says, I know you'll get it. No one else will, it's meant for you. And so he goes and in the back in his library and pulls out this giant yellow square book that's about yay thick, okay? And on the front of it, is a picture of Noble Drew Lee, and it says the uh, exhuming of a na- of a nation. Okay, the biography of Noble Drew Lee. And I looked at it. He goes, "I know." He says, "I know you've been struggling with a missing piece." And he says, "Nothing else in ufology is satisfying it." And he says, "I, you know, I think this is what you're looking for." Uh, tell me what you think once you start looking at it. And I started absorbing the book. And as soon as I got home from that meeting that night and I, I couldn't stop because I felt like I was reading not just the ultimate missing piece to the whole thing, the story of the human race and human origins on this planet, but also something about 
my own past and my own history that I couldn't put together until I started looking into Noble Drew Ali and who he was at the time. Um, and yes, I'll go on record saying I, I, I see him as right up there with going through the same trials and tribulations as Isa or Muhammad or any other Abraham uh, at the port at the you know the pause of the Sphinx. Okay, he went through all of that. Uh, he was a genuine prophet. No, I don't think it was a mob of uh, white police cops that were able to kill him. Because if that's true, then then the crucifixion must have been true too. And if the crucifixion wasn't true for Jesus, then the mob hit from the cops wasn't true for Noble Drew Ali. He ascended just like any other Christ. OK, uh, why? Because he knew all the venomous hatred that had been used to infiltrate and in infect the Moorish community as it, as it existed at that point in the 1920s was so bad that he realized the only way he could truly make the biggest difference was to ascend to a higher plane and therefore influence everybody that way. So uh, which, hey, that's right in line with what all the other Christs did. OK, so um, he hands me that book and right off the bat, I could feel, you know, the electricity coming off the book even before I started reading it. And in reading through it, uh, this led up to Halloween, the end of October that year. And that's when that other visitation comes into play from the crone because she sees me reading it and she's like, ah, finally, you got the missing piece. We've been waiting. He says, now, are you on track with what you need to do? Are you ready to do this? And I said, yes. I said, now I understand. I said, I know what I have to do. I know who I was now in a past life. And I know now why I was brought back here. And I know why I was brought back as the white guy. Okay, because when I was coming back, I was expecting to come back as uh, someone who was dark skinned again or female. And the deal was no, you're, you're coming back as the one thing they fear the most. And that's their own reflection in the mirror, the white guy. So I was like, okay, I get it. Now I know why I'm here like this. That's precious, Richard. Thanks a lot. And uh, finally, that mini question. Uh, you did exchange with him. So, Dr. Devil Blair. Right. You will share, you know, the influences that he had on your work or just the, uh, you know, uh, share moments that you had with him. Yeah. I, um, I got to meet him. I, I had initially, at a time when I was doing my my own radio show, this was years ago, I had gotten to actually interview him on an episode on my radio show. Mm -hmm. And then in the years that followed after that, one of my trips to visit my family in New York, I went to Brooklyn and uh, met with uh, uh, um, um, Turtle Gang, Norris Francis, right? And yeah. he I'll took me to, um, the the place there that always has these community meetings and lectures and seminars in Brooklyn there okay it's a pretty cool store too and um that's the day I walked in and I saw oh Dr. Delbert Blair is talking I didn't even know he was going to be here so it was just the way things played out it was meant to be I walk in he's there he sees me and waves to me he says you know he was just about to start a lecture and he leans over and says stay here i want to talk to you later he says okay yeah i said okay i'll stay for the whole thing and it was great listening to him and actually get to see him talk in person and that was the first and last time that i ever got to talk to him because it was i think it was shortly after that he passed away um and i you know uh, he had one heck of a spirit for all the things he was dealing with at that point health-wise and when the lecture was over he um he had talked with me in private in the back he says so he says um 
he says, I love what you're doing. He says, what's your next steps? And I said, well, I'm trying to put together, and this was at that time, okay? I said, I'm trying to put together a human origins conference. And I said, I would love to have you speak there as the keynote speaker. And he said, yes. He said, let's do it. So unfortunately, by the time we got it off the ground, he had already passed away. But he was going to be the first keynote speaker for the Human Origins Conference. Um, but he had told me, he flat out, he says, don't stop. He says, what you're doing is important. He says, keep going. He says, I'm watching you. And he says, I've watched you over the years. And I, um, he says, I am uh, very, you know, he says, I'm very impressed with what you were doing. I'm very happy for you. Um, and so I think uh, at that point, I had one of my, he, ha he had, believe it or not, this surprised me. He had a copy of my book with him. And he says, since I have it with me, could you sign it for me? I said, okay. So, <laughs> so and I was shocked. I said, you, you just happen to have my book with you. Okay. <laughs> which, which book did he have though? Uh, uh, that, um, it was at that time, um, what year? Uh, I had already come out with, that was legions. legions, right. He had Legions of Light, Armies of Darkness, that one, yeah. Because <clears throat> it wasn't until 2015 that I came out with More Mason and Alien, A Call to Action. So, and I know, I'm pretty sure the time I went to Brooklyn at that point was before, just before 2015. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so thanks a lot, Richard. Now we're going to open up the uh, Q&A section. So what we're going to do, uh, allow to, you know, mention your appellation and where you come from to Richard. So what we could do, uh, you know, so just raise your hand. Okay, so then after this, I'm going to let you know so you could go. And in the meantime, if anyone has questions, just raise your hand, you know, so while, you know, the, um, the people is going to ask a question to Richard, and Richard's going to answer, I'll keep note, you know. Yeah, who's coming in and the order. So, uh, Richard, before I do so, so your web page, then again, your web page, then again, uh, you want to yeah, share? You, you can find me at ufoteacher.com. Yep. That's the main website there. Yep. Uh, my books are on there. Um, the foundation link is on there for the Human Origins Foundation under events, you'll find the Human Origins Conference. Um, my gallery is on there. If you wanna see the artwork I started out with even before I got into the writing. So um, you can even take a look at the artwork that's on there that inspired the writing uh, right at the very beginning, back in the uh, early nineties. So um, I have everything there. Uh, now uh, with the newest, um, the newest project is going to be Fringe TV on the Roku device. Uh, my wife and I are doing that as an outcropping of the Human Origins Conference, the Human Origins Foundation, and everything I write about in the books. Uh, and we are definitely looking for content providers to get their shows on there, their videos. Okay, so check it out because uh, you might enjoy the content we have on there already, and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, Richard. So we're gonna open up the uh, Q and A. So we have here uh, Tausif. So awesome! Uh, it's been great talking with all of you. Thank you for having me. You you all have a wonderful day and stay safe. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Same to you. Have a good one. Thank you. Uh,